this has really been um, it's really been good. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I appreciate your prayers for me with this. Uh, I don't know if it's just weather or what happened, but all of a sudden it just about <clears throat> went. Um, let me do a commercial before I before I preach. There's some of our tracks back there on the uh, on the table, and uh, there's some that are uh, open and single. You can uh, you can have them. There's some in a uh, boxes. There's 500 in a box, and uh, there's no price on them. Whatever you want to uh, give to help us do another printing, uh, that'd be appreciated. And uh, I really, I really felt like <clears throat> about a year or so ago that we ought to just uh, go by faith and trust God. It's His, it's His word. It's His seed. He has to, He has to provide the seed and and, uh, and do everything, bring forth the fruit, and uh, we're just. We're just instruments of, <clears throat> of His. And we also have a, an illustrated Gospel of John. Uh, it has, a, has an illustrated track in the front and uh, has a Bible salvation study course and the Gospel of John. We can print that with uh, your cover, whatever you might uh, whatever you might want it, and uh, we've got about we've got about ten cents each uh, wrapped up in those. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to have some of those, well, you can see me afterwards. A couple of places I'd like for you to uh, turn with me in your Bible to uh, the Book of James. First of all. And uh, then we're going to look at another passage of scripture. But first of all, I want to I want to read something to you, and uh, listen real careful. If you listen real careful, you'll get a real blessing out of this. Jim had a passion for God, a love for people, and a burden to communicate the gospel. But he wrestled with a question of how to bring the message of Christ into a setting that seemed so far from him. How could he help people see and embrace the truth when they had so little Biblical understanding. The barriers seemed insurmountable. The task appeared virtually impossible. Even with all of the obstacles in front of him, Jim knew he had to try. God had given him a vision to make a difference in the lives of these men and women. So try he did. In fact, he went to great lengths to relate to their culture. Links that would probably make you or me feel very uncomfortable. Following the example of the Apostle Paul, he took the bold risk to become all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. What kind of risk? For starters, he shaved his head right down to the skin. That is, except for the patch of hair, he grew long. Not only that, he began wearing it in a pigtail and even dyed it in a different color, all in an effort to fit in with the fashions of the people he wanted to reach. He also gave up his familiar business attire and began to dress like them. 
He even changed his eating patterns and started to dine in the style of the ones he cared so much about. Further, he worked hard to learn their vocabulary in the hopes that he would be able to effectively convey biblical teachings in their everyday street language. He read their papers, studied their ideas, and went out of his way to discover and build on whatever areas of common ground he had with them. Jim didn't do this all from a distance. No, he actually moved into the neighborhood with these people. He lived close to them, became their friend, and spent extended periods of time talking with them, getting to know them, playing with their children, all of this in spite of their non-Christian lifestyles and in almost every case, their outright rejection of his message. What did other church leaders think of all this? Did they celebrate Jim's tenacious commitment to reaching these unchurched people? Did they rally around him and support his courageous efforts? Did they uphold him in prayer and find ways to encourage him and spur him on in his bold evangelistic pursuits? Not even close. On the contrary, they mostly misunderstood, misrepresented, and openly maligned him. The very people who should have supported and helped him turned their their backs on him and his ministry. In many ways, he had to continue his efforts by himself. With the backing of just a few close friends who shared his vision. Jim paid the price of loneliness, weariness, and discouragement, along with criticism from much of the church. He also lived with the daily rejection of most of those he wanted to reach. And he did this year after year. Jim saw the task, faced the opponents, followed the vision, and by the grace and help of God, fulfilled his calling. Jim is an extraordinary example of doing the work of evangelism in a difficult situation. His life is a powerful illustration of evangelism against the odds. And today, generations later, countless people from the neighborhoods he worked so hard to reach, now know and serve Jesus Christ as their forgiver and leader. Jim, or as he's more widely known, James Hudson Taylor, is the man who more than a century ago gave up everything to build a ministry called China Inland Mission. More than anyone else is credited with turning so many in that nation to faith in Christ. And today, he's regarded widely as one of the greatest pioneers of the modern missions movement. Won't that curl your toenails? Where have we gone? What have we come to? We've come to the place that we're wrapped up in our little concept of a theological box. That, are now, that allows nothing in except our minute stupidity. Yeah. 
anybody who doesn't do it just like we do backslidden and out of the will of God. Sin is defined as something that someone else does that I don't. Holiness is defined by what you wear, how you comb your hair, what color your shirt is, what kind of glasses you wear, whether they're leather shoes or patent leather or plastic, and sandals, God forbid, that you'd ever wear those like Jesus or the rest of the apostles and disciples. And then we wonder, and then we wonder why we're not reaching people for Jesus Christ. I'm not suggesting that we turn the grace of God into lavish lasciviousness. God forbid. Not suggesting that at all. I'm simply suggesting that we be real and genuine. Know who you are. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But to think soberly. Paul's really saying there in Romans, don't think like a drunk. You know, man looks on us in one way and God another. Man looks on the outward appearance God looks upon the heart. When David was chosen and Samuel was to anoint him, that was a statement that was made. Don't look upon his stature. Don't see how handsome he is. Have you ever wondered why a missionary doing deputation whose family sings well or they play musical instruments or he's a good looking guy or she's a pretty woman and uh, they're very impressive. You ever wonder why they get their support quicker than some old country boy that comes in that God calls? See, we like Hollywood performances. We like for somebody to put on a put on a show. We like for everything to be choreographed. The man who can preach well and is considered a great pulpiteer in America is usually a flop on the mission field. If you don't believe it, do a little research. The best missionaries on the mission field are just common men who go about plodding every day. One step at a time. Not the flamboyant personality. But just that plotter gets up every day and tackles the task all over again. That's what Hudson Taylor did. That's what Livingston did. That's what C.T. Studd did. And 
you know, I don't know how I got started off on that. It has nothing to do with the sermon I'm going to preach, but I just felt like that we needed that. I don't know. I don't know when you get a little older. I'm, I'm just speaking for myself. I've been all over this world. Really. Ministered in more than 43 different countries. Spent time as missionaries coming up on uh, 50 years in the ministry at the end of this, this November. Seen a lot of things and done a lot of things. Some good and some bad. Made a lot of mistakes. But when you get a little older, there's one thing that you always come to appreciate. You know what it is? Reality. You look back on a lot of things and you discover there's there's no substance. It's just whipped cream and froth. Like cotton candy. There's just no substance. You touch it and it's gone. About all you get from it is diabetes. <laughs> you know, I, I really believe God longs for us to be real. I was in a church a little while back and I said, you know, I said, every man and woman in this church needs to get a divorce. And brother, I'll tell you, eyes opened chins dropped, ears perked up, and some were absolutely horrified. And then I added, from public opinion. Jack Wood, as a lot of you know, is a very unique individual. And, uh, Jack and I knew each other for a long, long time. I met him in 1942 when he had a wagon and a little horse and he's peddling fruits and vegetables in Cottage Grove. I remember a kid coming down with his little horse and wagon selling peaches, screaming at the top of his voice, Lady, lady, throw down that ball-headed baby and grab your pan because here comes your peach man. <laughs> In that old loudspeaker, you know, and uh, crazy way to do things, but you know, that's... Well, it was. You'd have to be from Cottage Grove to know what that means. But anyway, I met him there in Houston, and we knew each other for a long time. But Jack had a lot of funny things that he said and a lot of real wise things that he said. And uh, if you told him something that didn't amount to a hill of beans. He always had a standard answer. Who cares? I've heard him say it with some guy standing behind the pulpit. Preaching up a storm and get 
off on some cockeyed idea and Jack say, who cares? You'd have to know him. Real experience in life. You know, how many of you remember where you were on September the 11th when those two planes flew into those World Trade Center buildings in New York City? All of you do. I sat there. I had got up, made a cup of coffee, went sat down in the recliner, and went through my little ritual. First, to turn on the Weather Channel. That's how. That's how. That's how you know how old you are when the Weather Channel becomes your favorite channel. <laughs> Turn on Weather Channel and see what the weather's going to be today. And uh, then I would flip over to a news channel. And when I did, I saw that this first plane had crashed into that building and everybody thought it was an accident. Somebody thought some uh, malfunction and that's what they were talking about but when that second plane deliberately hit that second tower they knew that it was no accident uh, it seemed it seemed strange uh I learned by experience the meaning of the word surreal. You knew it was real, but it seemed like a movie. It was strange. And uh, had quite a quite an impact. But then, about a week later, uh, someone had copies of uh, Newsweek and Time and U.S. News and World Report. And uh, they were covering this. A couple of them put out a special edition that was in was on the newsstands within a couple of days. Well, what I watched on TV and what I saw in the magazine was totally different. I don't know about you, but when I saw it in the magazine in still form, it had a it had a far greater shock to me than what I saw on television. I saw some things in the magazines that they didn't show on TV. I saw a man and a woman 50 floors up who joined hands and jumped. Picture of them coming down, holding hands. I thought, I thought, could you have ever convinced that man and that woman that they would do such a thing the day before? Could you have ever convinced them, listen, tomorrow you're going to join hands with someone and you're going to jump 
50 floors high to your death, to the concrete below. Well, they'd say, you're, you're, you're crazy. You're insane. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do anything that, that, that crazy. But they did. What a difference a day makes. What a difference. James said in chapter 4 and verse 13, which is a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, these words, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Ye know not what shall be on the morrow. I'll tell you, it's kind of a, it's kind of a scary thing when you think about it. You may be in, you know, you may be in the greatest blessing of God in your life. You may be experiencing the greatest joy that you've ever known as a Christian. But then again, you may be in the deepest valley you've ever dreamed of. You may be going through the greatest tragedy and sorrow that you've ever felt. Either could be true. The question is, whatever life brings our way, how do we react? It's not the question, it's not the question of what's coming your way. Not the question of what's going to happen in your life. Either this or that, or good or bad, or mediocre or common or uncommon? That's not the question. What are you going to do with it? Whatever it may be. You know what people said about September the 11th? Everything changed. And a lot of things really did. I remember Barbara Olson she was scheduled to attend a meeting somewhere on the West Coast. Her husband, I believe, Secretary of the Treasury, something of that nature, in politics. And uh, she was scheduled to fly out the day before. But she delayed her flight and her leaving in order to have a birthday breakfast with her husband the next morning. And she took one of the planes that crashed and she was killed. Scott Beamer was just a 
common guy, you know, just like anybody else uh, that you would meet. Nobody ever thought Scott Beamer would be some kind of hero, but he's the guy on Flight 93 that said, let's roll and took over the cockpit and that plane crashed in Pennsylvania in a field, probably saving thousands of other lives, even though they gave their own. What a difference a day makes. Think of, think of the rich man and Lazarus. One day this rich man's living in splendor and feasting and having a great time. And Lazarus is laying at his gate full of sores, suffering, pain. And the next day, one is in hell and the other is in Abraham's bosom. Boy, what a difference a day makes. What a change. What about the days of Noah? One day these people are scoffing and laughing and poking fun at a crazy old fool that's been working on something he calls an ark for 120 years. And saying that it's going to rain and there's never been anything but a little mist. And then the next day, the rain begins to fall. Boy, what a difference a day makes. One day these people in Sodom are laughing, blaspheming, raping, pillaging, plundering. And the next day, they're burning. One day... Joseph is in a dungeon. One day he has a dream. The next day he's delivered. One day Moses is floating in a little basket in the Nile River with the crocodiles. And the next day He's found by the king's daughter. One day, Peter is in Gethsemane with Jesus, drawing his sword and ready to fight and saying, I'll never leave your side. And the next day, he's swearing and cursing and denying that he ever knew Jesus. One day Paul is persecuting the church and killing Christians and bringing them bound to Jerusalem. And the next day, he's preaching on the streets of Damascus. Boy, what a difference a day makes. One day James is taken and slain with the sword and Peter's thrown into prison intending to be beheaded the next day himself. One day he's laying there one night in the stocks facing death and the next day he's in a prayer meeting. One day on November the 19th, 1954, I was in a jail cell facing 15 years to life for an armed robbery and habitual criminal charge. Just gotten out of the Arizona State Penitentiary. Come back to Houston, stayed in my mother's house, and found that while I was gone, 
some of them got saved and went to a little Baptist church. And one night, I was out doing dope and everything else with the guys, and the next day I was Sunday morning sitting in this church with a little short, wild preacher that was walking all over the platform, up and down the aisle, preaching against everything from I Love Lucy to Domino's. One day laying there, God began to deal with my heart and my life, and I felt like that I was going to hell. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I had no idea about our most gracious, omnipotent, and divine Heavenly Father. That's all right. But I didn't know anything like that. I just said, hey man, look at him. It's the way I always talked. I came off the streets. And uh, I, I just, I mean, I don't mean anything respectful, but I just said something like, hey old man, I need help. In all my ignorance and stupidity, God heard my prayer. I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know how to be saved. That preacher said something about being saved and I don't know how. And I remembered a Sunday school teacher one time when I went to vacation Bible school. I was eight years old. Went one time to Larkin Street Baptist Church and I remember two things about that vacation Bible school. I made a coat hanger out of a piece of plywood that was in the shape of an alligator. And uh, they gave us a coping saw to cut it out and screw the top for a coat hanger. I remember that. And I remember a teacher standing there with a piece of cardboard and a heart drawn on the piece of cardboard and a little door cut out explaining Revelation 3.20 where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. And I remember her saying, You see, there's no latch on the outside. You have to open the door from the inside. And if you'll open your heart, Jesus will come in to your life all that came back to me and all I said was God if that's how you get saved that's what I'll do that moment I knew that Christ came into my life my heart and I began to wonder how I was going to how I was going to witness to all these guys down in prison that I knew. See, I I couldn't win the case. I was guilty. They had the guy that drove the getaway car and he signed a confession and the man that I robbed made a positive identification and I had no money to hire a lawyer or make bail. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to tell James Greer when I get down there. He was the guy that drove the getaway car in the armed robbery. I thought, what am I going to do? How can I witness to all these people that have I've been in and out of jail and reform school with and, and done dope and all that stuff? How, how am I going to do that? And while I was running all this through my mind, the jailer came and took me downstairs and I thought they were taking me from the city jail where I was to the county jail to wait till my trial came up on the docket. 
But instead, he took me downstairs, gave me my belongings, opened the door and said, get out and don't come back. Now, I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> I'm stupid, but I ain't dumb. That's no questions. And the next morning, I'm sitting in this wild preacher's house trying to get him to explain to me what happened to me the night before and he's going through 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. What a difference a day makes. I've been on heroin for five years. The next morning I walked into the bathroom and I remembered that I'd hidden a capsule of heroin in my mama's medicine cabinet. I'd got my razor and I was ready to shave and I remember I had that and I was oh man. So I got it out, got the spoon and the eyedropper and I'm cooking this up and I heard this voice. And I was in this little bathroom. My mama lived in a little shotgun house about 12 feet wide and 24 feet long. A little bathroom about this wide, maybe five or six feet long. And I heard this voice said, you don't need that anymore. And I looked around, there wasn't nobody there. So I just kept fixing it up and I heard this voice again. said, you don't need that anymore. And I thought, man, God is in this bathroom. <laughs> they scared the daylights out of me. Man, I took that stuff and I flushed it down the commode and washed the spoon out and all the rest of it. And I've never had another shot of dope since then. Amen. I didn't go to a care hospital. I didn't go to Alcoholics Anonymous or nobody else anonymous. I didn't taper off. I didn't get on methadone. I just got saved. Amen. Amen. I don't think God loves me any more than he does anybody else. You say, well, you have you must have had a lot of faith. Faith? I didn't even know what faith was. I knew a girl named Faith. You know. She didn't have much faith. But what a difference a day makes. I want to close with this. There was a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was praying one day and an angel came and told him that uh, your prayers have come up as a memorial before God. Later on, Peter's got the audacity to tell him that God is no respecter of persons. Now, you figure that one out. But anyway, this angel tells him to send some men to Joppa to a certain house, find this guy Peter, and he's going to be on the housetop praying, and you tell him I said that God said come down here to Cornelius' house. Now there's a word. They Luke said and on the morrow they came 
to Joppa the next day. Then Peter made them spend the night, spent the night, and on the morrow they left again. And then the morrow after that they came to the house of Cornelius. Now look, here's a man who heard God's message. And Peter was coming, God's man, to bring him the message of salvation. He said, you send those two men, bring Peter up here, and he'll tell you what to do. Now here's a man ready to be saved. Everything's in place. But Cornelius needs one more thing before he can be saved. Do you know what it is? you know what it was? He needed one more thing. He needed to live until Peter got there. See, three days passed. And on the fourth day, if you'll read that passage, each time where it says, and on the morrow, and on the morrow, and on the morrow after. Four days. He needed to live until Peter got there with a message. What a difference a day makes. We have God's message. We have the Word of God. We have the Word of life and the message of salvation. A lot of people are going to die and go to hell before anybody gets there with the message. What a difference a day makes. Shall we pray? Father, we pray that you'll help us to know and comprehend the urgency of the hour and the importance of time, that time is running out. And one day, all this will be over. The trumpet will sound. We'll rise to meet Jesus in the air. What a difference that day is going to make. Lord, it'll make a great difference of joy for us, but a great difference of doom for others. Who, those who believe a lie that they might be damned who believed not the truth. Father, we pray that you'll help us to know and understand what a difference a day makes. In Jesus' name, amen. Chris.